Good morning, this is Deborah Richardson and I just want to do a quick check. I can't tell on the screen. Can someone type in the questions or the chat whether or not you can see my screen? Again, this is Deborah Richardson. If someone could type in the question box or the chat, whether you can see my screen. Okay, I do have a couple people that say that they can see it. So I will go ahead and get started. Um, if at any time you are unable to see the screen, please keep in mind that you can download the handout and you can follow along on the PDF of the presentation. So welcome to the live webinar, Vendor Master File Cleanup, Tools to Validate Vendor Data and Find Duplicates. Uh, just some housekeeping items before we get started. This session is being recorded. You will receive a link to the recording within three days. Feel free to submit your questions anytime. They will be saved for the Q&A session during the last 10 to 15 minutes. If I don't get to all of the questions asked during the Q&A session, I will follow up with answers via email. And you may also submit additional questions via email as well. And then lastly, again, don't forget to download the handout. It's a PDF of the presentation, and it does have links to all of the tools that I mentioned here. So I am Deborah R. Richardson, and you may have heard of me by my tagline, putting the AP in happy. Um, as a previous AP senior manager, managing a team of 17, processing over 2,000 vendor requests per month, I now work with AP vendor teams that are still fully or partially manual to add authentication techniques, internal controls, and best practices. I work was responsible for maintaining 140,000 active global vendors across seven different ERPs and the distribution of over 24,000 1099s and 1042s per year. So yes, there was a cleanup process for each of those ERPs. Um, I did wanna let you know, I have the only site that is dedicated to the vendor setup and maintenance process, where I have some free resources and tools, including a blog and a podcast, both are known for providing actionable steps like you will see in this webinar to help you with your vendor maintenance issues. So let's review the agenda. We will first review my proprietary vendor process system, um, authentication, validation, management, from which everything that I do is based on. And then we'll look at my five-day vendor master file cleanup process, which is what this webinar is based on, the tools that I use for that. And then we'll look at the tools specifically for um, validating vendor information, um, finding missing, missing information, and then also finding and resolving duplicates. And then we'll wrap up with a Q&A session. Okay. So let's talk about my proprietary authentication, validation, and uh, management process that I use for my clients that still have fully manual or partially manual vendor processes to avoid both fraud and regulatory fines. 
And so the first step is authentication, which is the confirmation of the vendor data source or delivery method of the vendor documentation. So the data source would be who, who is sending. The delivery method can either be email or vendor portal or fax or even hard copy. So for example, if you have a vendor self-registration portal, you would rely on the delivery method to confirm since the login requirement authenticates the data source. If you are relying on email, fax, or hard copy, then you would authenticate the data source using the authentication techniques uh, that I provide. And for anyone that is interested, I have an on-demand recording of a webinar called Protecting Vendor Bank Details When You Receive Changes Via Email Beyond the Phone Call. That gives steps to add authentication in the existing vendor changes process. It also gives an option to eliminate that confirmation via phone call. And that is a free recording if you want to register for that. And the link is there. Also, step moving on to step two. Um, step two is validation, where you validate existing or validate vendor data before it is entered into your ERP. And to help with this, I do have a free download vendor validation reference list with resource links, which identifies not only resources to verify a vendor is real and not on any watch list, but it is also divided based on the type of information being validated and on which um, uh, document you'll find it, such as the invoice for a contract. Now, the third step is management, where you revalidate or inactivate existing vendors in your vendor master file on a consistent basis. So that means inactivating those vendors you haven't done business with, checking for duplicates, and then revalidating the active vendor data. Um, the tools I use for this step is the focus of this webinar today. And of course, I have another free on-demand webinar, Eight Steps to Clean Your Vendor Master File when you're doing it manually. So if you need a vendor master file cleanup process, um, please make sure you register um, and then watch that webinar where I talk about um, uh, the steps I take when I perform the service for my clients. Um, lastly, let's get this up here. Um, I do have a, an e-guide that includes five authentication techniques, 12 internal controls, and 13 um, plus uh, best practices along with other considerations when onboarding and maintaining vendors. So now that you see my entire process, let's take a quick look at the five-day vendor master file cleanup service that I do for my clients, which this webinar is based on. So clients reach out to me for this cleanup service to get ready for 1099, 1042 distribution. It's about that time of year too. Um, or if they have an upcoming AP automation project to make sure they have an accurate vendor list or right after a merger or acquisition where they have brought in vendors to the vendor master file and you know you don't know how that information was collected so this is a good service for that event um, or you just need that recurring ongoing maintenance to ensure your vendors are real have not changed their vendor legal name or tax id or ended up on a watch list since they were originally onboarded. And so my five-day vendor master file cleanup service is where you give me a file and I will return it with the results of the validations. Um, I'll also have some recommendations of vendors to inactivate. I will also identify 
duplicates at the vendor level and or the site or location level, um, depending on your accounting system or ERP, and then identify you know, what needs to be followed up on. Now, on average, my clients see a 50% reduction in their active vendor records, and then I find an average of about 5% of duplicates found. And you can always contact me for an immediate quote, and then I will also have a webinar attendee bonus at the um, end of the presentation so stick around for that all right so we're gonna I'm gonna launch the first poll question here and that is when is the last time you inactivated your uh, vendors in your accounting system or ERP and that should be up on your screen now And I'll give you a few minutes or a couple of, a minute or so to answer. So is that this month, last quarter, last year, um, sometime before 2019, you think, or maybe even never? Um, we know how that goes, especially if you don't have a big vendor master file. Um, there may have been, um, legacy folks who didn't necessarily think it needs to be cleaned up. So no problem in being honest, I've seen it all. Okay, so it looks like we have, it's almost, um, we've got answers in each one of those. So no one feel bad about what you selected um, because everybody selected something. But for the most part, we had um, people answer, um, uh, this month and last quarter. So for those of you who answered in one of those um, responses, um, hopefully you can find some additional tools that you can use as you clean your vendor master file. And for those that are just getting started, um, same thing. Um, hopefully this will be a good way to get you started with some tools that you can use. And then um, uh, just keep that part of your normal process. So I'm gonna go ahead and close it. Thanks everyone for voting. All right, so let's get started with validating vendor um, information. And when I talk about validating vendor information, I'm really talking about the legal name and tax ID combination. You know, that's important um, for US vendors, um, the vendor address, um, the bank routing numbers. And then I'll also talk a little bit about bank ownership. Okay. So I only use TenCheck. Um, and this is really for the IRS 10 match, the legal name and tax ID. I, I only use 10 check and not the IRS e-services because the IRS e-services only does one thing, the 10 match. While 10 check is connected directly to the IRS 10 match records and it just does um, so much more. So let me go ahead and click this and let me show you how I use it. Um, and the so much more is really, you know, the, um, of course it does the IRS 10 match with the legal name and tax ID, but it also does the exempt IRS exempt organization. So you don't need to go to a separate site to do that verification of nonprofit vendors. Um, it also is connected to the USPS address standardization um, tool. And then it also has 24 plus watch lists that it checks. And then it also checks um, social security numbers against the social security death master file. So I'll tell you if, they, if you have a match there, if someone is trying to be fraudulent using um, a social security number of someone that has um, passed away. So let's go ahead and open that up. And yep, yeah, looks like you guys can see it. And I'm going to go in and just click on verify. Now this has the um, ability to do single lookups and then also bulk, but we're going to do the single lookup first. And so I'm going to use um, the uh, Salvation Army as an example and we're going to put in the street i probably should have cut copy and paste pass away 
plus drive. And I'll spell that out for drive, and you'll see in a minute what that does. Indiana, Polis, and then Indiana. Zip code is 46250. Okay, so now I'm going to click um, run validation. And by the way, I always use this at 80%. You can, um, if you already have it, or if you're thinking about getting it, you can look up what that match threshold means. But looking at the results here, you'll notice that um, the everything that's in green is always really good. So the 10 and the name mat combination matches ER, IRS EIN records. The EIN in name matches a requested name. Um, and if you look down here at the address, it standardizes it for you. And it even, because um, it removed the drive spelled out and replaced that with DR. And then it also gave you the plus four. So that's good. And then because this is a nonprofit, it did find some hits on the IRS exempt organization list. And you can click that to expand. And so you can see the address matches here. And so um, that does identify it as a valid nonprofit. Something to keep in mind with some of the COVID scams that are going around. You always want to make sure that you validate your nonprofits and also the upcoming Giving Tuesday, which I think is the, either, the, either the first or second Tuesday every November. So that's good. And then these are all the additional watch lists and sanction lists that it checks. Um, I said 24 plus, but it has much more than that um, because it does a lot of the casino gaming um, at the state level, those lists. But the first one here is um, OFAC. So it does OFAC, um, no hit there. If you are a healthcare organization, you are, you are not allowed to do business with um, a vendor that is on the Office of Inspector, Inspector General OIG list. And so it checks that here. Um, and then there's also on here somewhere where it has, um, if you are a government, then you are not allowed to do business with vendors that are on the SAM, the System of Award Management Exclusion List, and that one is on here as well. So it does so much more um, than the uh, legal name and tax ID validation. And so that's why I use it. Um, the other reason that I use it is to just verify um, if I have a tax ID and a legal name that does not match, I can do what I consider a reverse um, lookup. So I can um, find the name using the tax ID. And this comes in very handy if you have do I do another one, enough of those? Um, this can come in very handy if you have a vendor that has supplied a W-9 or some documentation that has their DBA on it instead of their legal name. And that can happen a lot because it, um, the people that are filling out the W-9s or giving you that information aren't always the people that are familiar with their tax structure or how the business is registered on the IRS. And so this can come in very handy for that. So instead of um, having a name in here, I'll just put in testing. And then if you run that validation, you'll see that it will find an EIN um, match and it will be Microsoft. So I use it for that. Now, this is for individual lookups. And if you've got a whole vendor master file that you want to check first, you can definitely use the bulk option. It doesn't come automatically with 10 checks. So if you have a, let's go here first. If you have a subscription plan and you don't see this bulk, you have to contact them and then they will turn that on for you. Um, but the bulk 10 file matching, um, it is a paid service. Unlike the IRS, you can send them a bulk um, file and uh, it doesn't cost anything. But the bulk file, really is a text file and it contains one or two, um, which uh, uh, identifies it as a social security number or a 10 and then it'll have, or an EIN, and then I'll have the tax ID number, the vendor name, and then a reference. And I always use either the vendor ID 
or if the tax ID has multiple lines, I will use the um, uh, uh, vendor record or vendor row number on the Excel sheet. Um, but basically you give that to them and within a few hours um, you will get back a file and that file um, will have on it um, whether or not the um, uh, it'll have one of these numbers and it'll tell you what that means. You definitely want to have the zeros. Anything else you may need to look up. Um, but it does do the validations here. Now it doesn't do the um, the address standardization or validation like it would if you did a single um, on the single tool. But that's um, I'll get to that with the next um, with the next tool. So that is 10 match and let's now move that out of the way and we'll go back to the next one. Okay. Now the next one is Smarty Streets and again because I do a bulk upload with 10 check and you can't um, include the addresses. I use Smarty Streets to find for um, bulk upload for addresses. And what I really like about it is that unlike um, the United States Postal Service or TenCheck that is connected to the United States Postal Services database, um, Smarty Streets will not only standardize the address for you, but it'll also give you the status of the address. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, and um, pointing out to its domestic or international addresses. Um, they do have uh, free and paid subscription plans and you can do a single address lookup or use their bulk paste tool. So I'm gonna go ahead and see if that'll work. Here we go. All right, so let's come here and so I think you can see my screen. Nope, still looks like you see 10 check. Let me go back. Okay, so I stopped sharing and started sharing again. So hopefully you can see my screen um, is, can someone put in the, and uh, can someone put in the uh, questions whether, or chat whether or not you can see Smarty Streets? Um, because what it does is when I, when I switch screens sometimes, it won't always show me the audience's view. Um, if for some reason you're not able to see it, um, please feel free to go to smartystreets.com. That's uh, S-M-A-R-T-Y, streets.com. And hopefully you'll be able to follow along that way. But with Smarty Streets, they really have two um, tools that I use. And let's go to the... Um, Let's go to the single address verification first. And so looking at um, the single address validation tool, I'm gonna go ahead and I will use um, the same one that we had for um, the Salvation Army. Nice drive. Okay, and then you can see here that it found a valid address. Everything is green, that's great. Um, it also um, identifies whether or not that address is active, and then it'll tell you whether it's vacant. And so that's something that's a little different. Um, it's They're getting it from the United States Postal Service, but when you do like an address check um, on USPS.com, they don't give you those statuses, but the status are available and so that's what Smarty Streets gives you. Um, the in at, uh, It also has it for international as well and so I do want to go and I want to show you the um, bulk validation which I really like. This is very immediate and so you're able to get um, come on you're able to get, oh, it's down here. You're able to get immediate results. So let me go ahead and put some addresses in here. And you can 
update or add up to, I think it's 100,000 addresses before it gets tired. So you've got quite a bit of, um, of uh, leeway here. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste this in. And all I did was paste in information from an Excel sheet. It looks very non-formatted, but it is um, formatted. And so as soon as you paste it in, here comes, um, let's paste that in. So it should have, it does give you an example file and actually that's where I took it from. So let me try this one more time. But basically you put your information in here and then you just scroll down and it will process that list. And if you look over here, it tells you whether it's match mailable or, um, or some other status. Now, again, it looks very unformatted, but if you copy it um, just by clicking that button and then paste it, I'll bring this over. Um, and hopefully you can see my screen. It's an Excel sheet with the results. And the thing that I love about it is that it tells you whether it's match mailable or some other status. Um, and so this really means that all these addresses are mailable. It means your 1099s um, are going to get to where you send them to and won't come back on you. So that's really good. Um, one other thing that I wanted to show you as is here and you can get um, multiple statuses back. Um, so the statuses, we, we got match mailable on those because those were samples and that's fine. But there's also a status of no match, meaning the address is invalid. You can also get a status of match vacant, which means that the address is valid, but nobody's picking that up, meaning the um, post office delivered it, nobody picked it up, they brought it all back to the post office, still no one picked it up, so they're no longer delivering mail there. It's vacant. Um, there's also a match inactive, uh, which means the address is valid, but it's inactive. That happens a lot if you have like new developments or sometimes people will make it inactive um, if they want for personal privacy reasons. And then also there's a no match or PO box only. And you know we always want um, street addresses for our vendors so we can make sure they're valid. And so what I tend to say when I send these back is I ask my um, clients to do further research or follow up with the vendor on no match on match vacant, and then also on no match PO box only. So that's why I use um, Smarty Streets. Okay. And so now I am back to the presentation and I can't, again, I can't see if you can see it, but hopefully you can. If not, um, please make sure you download the presentation and follow along. Uh, follow along. Um, and so after Smarty Streets um, to validate the address and um, uh, Ten Check to validate the legal name, tax ID combination, and the watch list, I always um, validate the federal um, with the Federal Reserve and SWIFT the routing numbers and the SWIFT and BIT codes. And one for the ACH and, and wire numbers, they can be different numbers even for the same bank. And then also just due to bank mergers and acquisitions, which happen all the time, um, they, uh, they can change. And as most of you on this call probably know, you'll get a notice of change from the bank only so many times before you're hit with a NACHA violation um, if you don't update that routing number. So it's best to verify these numbers when you check your vendor master file. And so I use the FRB services. I won't demo that. Um, uh, I'm sure all of you have used that, but I do, sorry about that, but I do have the link here. And then the same thing with swift.com, um, having, um, being able to validate the SWIFT and the BITCO where I-bands uh, for countries that don't have an I-band. Now, 
those services are free. Um, I have noted some paid options below. So this first one, Acuity, um, I've noted, if you're looking for a complete history of routing numbers, you can also use a service um, called TGBR, which has, um, it's an uh, online software and it has several other products, um, including the IBAN Complete, which will verify the format of the IBAN. I've actually used this service before as a practitioner. It is expensive, but when you um, are able to validate the IBAN, IBAN format without having to identify, you know, Google um, uh, resources, which can result in different formatting results, um, uh, even for the same country, it's, it's a good option. Um, for bank account ownership, um, when I do the five-day vendor master file cleanup for my clients, I can't have an account to validate ownership because I'm not doing business with the client uh, with the vendors. But if my client has an account with, say for example, Gaiac, <clears throat> who can validate bank account ownership, the legal name, vendor legal name with the bank account holder name, I will use that. And then there's also another service called NS Knox, and it really is a database of validated ownership um, uh, based on a pre-note. And so if they're not, your vendor's not in the database, they'll be given instructions on how to do that pre-note. And so both are really good options for validating bank account ownership, but I only do those if I have, if my client has those. So those are, uh, those options are there for you. Now we're at the second poll question. <clears throat> um, how often do you check to see if your vendors are on the OFAC sanction list? So let me launch that. <clears throat> and the options are at regularly scheduled recurring intervals during the year, um, annually, uh, at vendor setup only. We don't check OFAC or I don't know. Okay. Now I will say when I was a practitioner um, that uh, we had a different group that our risk management group would come in, they get a, um, we had an automated report going to them, and I think it was either monthly or quarterly, and then they would do the OFAC sanction list. But technically, you are not supposed to pay any vendor that is uh, that is on this list. And so um, I, I don't think it's valid to check before every pay cycle, but a regularly scheduled um, routine would be great. If you do have like a vendor self-registration portal or some other type of portal that has continuous monitoring, that um, OFAC is definitely included in that. And so that's a good thing. So we've got most of the folks have voted um, and the results, uh, we don't have anyone doing it at scheduled regular recurring intervals. Um, no one's doing it annually. Um, we've got a few that are doing it at vendor setup only. Um, most people, uh, half of folks don't know, and then the majority answer, we don't check OFAC. So I do recommend that you add OFAC to your um, validation list, um, at, at, at least at vendor onboarding. And then um, also um, you can use something like tincheck.com to do a regular verification of um, the OFAC and some other watch lists. Um, so I do recommend that. So thanks for voting everyone. And I'm gonna go ahead and close that. And then we'll go to the next one. So now let's talk about finding missing information. So for the five day vendor master file cleanup, I do offer an add-on service for vendor communication where I do the follow-up to find missing information since the initial cleanup is done. Um, and that really equates to the tax ID, uh, tax ID and the addresses. Um, and since email addresses to reach out to the vendors are scarce, I have found other tools to help with that. 
And so the first one is the SEC, the Edgar database. And you can find tax IDs for public companies. Um, you can find addresses for public companies and it's free. So let me bring that over. And I've just gone to the sec.gov and I'm hoping you can see my screen because uh, the webinar tool doesn't show, but I've gone to sec.gov and I'm clicking company filings. And I always use the Ecker full text search. And so I will click more options just to give me the opportunity to just type in the, um, vendor name and so i'll just use microsoft and so microsoft comes up and the 8k report um, i can usually find uh i usually use that one and as you can see here that gives the um, irs number for or irs employer identification number for microsoft and then it also gives an address now this may not be um it could be the tax address uh, address may it may or may not be the remit address for your invoices but um, um, you can find tax IDs and addresses for public companies here. Okay. So that's SEC. And then next is the um, HIPAA space. So you can find EINs for healthcare businesses, and you can also find um, business and mailing addresses. Um, it is free with some paid options. Um, I only use this for like a single lookup, not a bulk uh, update or a bulk lookup. So um, I'm clicking on here the HIPAA space, um, H I P A A space.com and I've gone to the EIN um, verification and you can either type in the EIN number or the vendor legal name. I'm just gonna stick with the Salvation Army. Okay. And as you can see, I didn't even have to hit the search button. Lots of stuff come up, came up. Um, but you can see the, the um, you can match your ad an address that you have if you have one and I'll click here and then you can see that it shows the EIN number, it gives um, some additional information, some may be populated, some not. It has a business address and then if available, it may also have a mailing address as well. So this is free. Um, and again, this is for healthcare um, businesses. Okay. So that's HIPAA space. And then another one that I use is EIN Finder. Now, EIN Finder, it finds EINs from government records. It has a database of 8.5 million EINs. You can also find a next code, and this is a paid or subscription subscription based um, product. And you can do the single lookup tool, or you can submit a file to them with many vendors and then they'll give you a quote on the price for a file um, uh, depending on the number of vendors that you have but um, I really like it because it gives me a place to try to go and find um, uh, EINs and so I'm going to just use we'll stick with Microsoft um, again so I'll use Microsoft Corp. Um, you can either put limited to a state if you want. And so you search it here and then it'll give you the list of everything that it found. And it will also identify how, what the, how many times that EIN occurs, 10%, 10%. Um, this one's 20%, it's the highest in the list. And this is the one, if you remember from the example from 10 check. So um, this does, uh, this does uh, 
uh, find the EINs for you. It also can give you the um, next code. I don't really pay a whole lot, a lot of attention to the IRS match. Any of the EINs, tax IDs that I find on any resource, I always do a bulk included in um, a bulk upload for an additional 10 check um, uh, 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 file validation, or I'll do use a single validation tool. I never, if I find it on anything outside of the vendor, I always do a subsequent check. So. I would use this one. I would put it on the bulk up my next bulk upload file, or I'll do a single ad, a single um, check, and then I'll verify it. And it does have the addresses here um, as well. And that was the one that was on the SEC. Do I still have that open? That was the one that was on the SEC here. So you can see that that matches. Another thing that I like about it is that um, you can do a reverse search. So let me put that in again. So I'll just put the, let's say you have an EIN and you don't know, you don't know who that matches, or again, they've given you a DBA name, then it brings up, you know, Microsoft Corporation. So you can do a reverse search on that as well. And um, this one, again, I like it. You know, there are other EIN services that are subscription based, but this is the only one that I use because it has an unlimited search plan. It's the only one that has an unlimited limited search plan. And because I do a lot of um, vendor cleanups, the other services have monthly limits and I just need the access. It wasn't really the cost, it was the access. Um, research or real search, R E A L S E A R C H, realsearch.com is another option. Um, I think the largest that they have is they'll give you 750 searches per month, which may be okay for you. Um, but for me, I use EIN Finder because it gives me an unlimited search for a year. And again, whatever you find, verify it first on 10Check or IRS.gov. Let's come out of there. And then another one that I use is Melissa.com. Now, I use Melissa. Um, I was familiar with this in the past. Um, I implemented, um, when I was a APC or manager, I implemented a vendor self-registration portal, and that portal used Melissa.com to validate addresses. Um, but it can also find EINs for nonprofit organizations, and it has a listware online tool where you can upload files and then request results with populated data. Now, it's paid um, and it's it's uh, uh, they only charge you based on the results of hits that they find, and they do give you free credits per month. So let's quickly just take a quick look at that. So this is Melissa.com, and I normally just go to use lookups. And you can see everything that it does, um, that it offers here. And we're just going to go really quick to the nonprofit um, organizations under federal resources. And this says zip code, but you can really enter in the zip code, the organization name, or their EIN. And we're just going to use the Salvation Army again and click Submit. And then if you look at this top one here, this is the exact one that I used for 10 check. And so I'll click on that. And when you click on it, it'll tell you that it's a 501c3 um, and then it will give you the tax ID number. And it'll also tell you how long it's been exempt, um, which can be good as well. And it's really um, taking this information from, I thought it was from the 990s, but this one doesn't look like it needs to file. But um, so it does have, uh, you can find information for nonprofits. Um, another thing that you can do um, that I have used it for is the um, list and the list where Where'd that go let me find that and that's where you can upload lists and let me grab the one that I have here let's just so I've just uploaded an Excel list, and now I've got some vendors that has um, 
uh, some addresses and I want to grab some information. And depending on what you select, this tells you what you're going to get back. And so let's just check business coder. And that's because with business coder, I can get back an EIN and it also verifies the company name and address. And so when you do that, um, you tell it that it has a header row. I've selected business coder. I'll go and select next. Here, I'll just um, do a, um, a, a map the file so i'm just telling that that it's a company name and i use microsoft google amazon and then i can tell it here everything that i want to get back so i can ask for the plus four because i have that um, i can ask for the sick code or the next codes um, and i can also ask for the ein here and so if i click next then it'll allow me to validate. I'll put a job name on it and then it'll process the file. But I'm just gonna quickly go to my dashboard because I've already done that um, here. And uh, I'm gonna go to the report. And so it tells you what it found. Like it'll say it found matches of two businesses, three addresses. It didn't say it found a match of the phone, but it does say that it appended two phone numbers. And so it didn't here find an EIN, and uh, but it'll tell you based on only on what it found, not on the volume of your vendors, but only on the information it found, how many credits you used. And um, Melissa will give you, I think it's a thousand free credits per month. Um, and so it's not as expensive as like an EIN finder if you gave them a file, but you also don't get a lot back. Because if you notice with this EIN, um, uh, Microsoft, at the very least, had an EIN that we found both on the SEC and then also on, um, uh, what was that other one, EIN Finder, and that was, uh, it, it was there, but they didn't find it here. So it, it's an option. It's a very inexpensive option that you can use when you're um, trying to find um, EINs. I usually come over here after I can't find it anywhere else just to see it if, if it's there. And so that's Melissa data. So let's get that out of the way. Okay. And then um, at for those vendors that have uh, email addresses, I do include vendor communication. So, um, and you can do the same um, using email addresses on the vendor record, you email the vendor. I usually use a mail merge um, function in Word that'll translate it or convert it to emails. And just make sure you include the respond by date, the AP phone number, and the AP fax number. And I usually ask them to verify their um, addresses if necessary. And then I will include a blank W8 um, or W9 and ask them to complete it. And if they are an international vendor, I'll ask them for their um, to send their applicable W8. And then really quickly, finding and resolving duplicates. Um, this one, so one of the funniest moments of my 20 plus year corporate life um, was when someone asked my then manager what accounting system we use. And she said with a straight face, Excel, which was true because I mean, we're always downloading reports or data out of our accounting system or ERPs and analyzing them in Excel or you know maybe now Google Sheets. And to find duplicates, a spreadsheet is what I use. Sometimes the ERPs or accounting systems have duplicate reports, which I will also request or or, or um, suggest that my clients use, but Excel is what I really use. And I used to be certified in Excel 2007, back when that ribbon first came out. And I was so excited, man, I was young, thought all changes were great, which, which those changes did turn out to be great. Um, except now I don't bother with remembering formulas. And you know, after I moved up and stopped using it day in and day out, you kind of lose that instant ability to know which formula to nest easily. And so I found some help and that was in AbleBits tools. And so for duplicates, I searched by 
tax ID, by legal name, by address, and by site. And I found AbleBids.com, an ultimate suite for Microsoft Excel. They also have power tools for Google Sheets that'll do the same thing. So let me just open up um, that file where I can kind of show you what I do. So let's go here. Okay. And so this is an Excel sheet. Um, it only has a few records, but if you were using your vendor file, it would be a ton of records. So just kind of imagine if you were trying to find duplicates by tax ID, you can put it in sort order, try to find it that way. You can try to do subtotals. Um, you can try to do pivot tables. What I do is I will highlight that row. And once you download um, AbleBits data, and you can download it for free, I think it's for two weeks weeks and um, don't buy it right away because they'll give you a 40% coupon I think after the first week but um, so I will take AbleBits data and I will do duplicate remover and I'll just click that and then I just want to find duplicates so let's look at duplicates and um, I highlighted the row that I want or column that I wanted which was tax ID I don't want them deleted I don't want to do anything I just want them to highlight it and so they're going to find um, duplicates here. And then if you filter by color, you'll see that now you found duplicate tax IDs. Okay. And if you notice here um, is different IDs. Um, sometimes, especially with media companies, they own multiple newspapers or media, different media types. And so you can find those here. And then here, it just looks like someone created two different vendors from the same vendor with different information. And so it's a great way to find it. Um, by legal name, I do something a little bit different, which um, I do love AbleBits for this. They also have a fuzzy duplicates. So you can find, um, you again, highlight it and it'll tell you which column here. And I usually do four um, max number of different characters. And you can make sure you have minimum number of characters in a word or cell. Um, but really it sees four. And this says typos, but uh, let's see what it finds. So it will list here um, different types of uh, vendors that it found that could be duplicates. You can see here that Showtime was misspelled um, here, fat fingered, and so it found it. Um, again, uh, IBM um, should not have any special characters in it. And so because we had the uh, four as, as different characters, it found it and then um, the again, the reason I used four was so I can find those that have the in it. And so you get the Rocky Horror Picture Show and then um, Rocky Horror Picture Show. And so it finds them. And so this way you don't have to worry about finding it um, with the naked eye. And then by address, um, the same thing. I just do a duplicate um, first and uh, occurrences. I put it on red and then I finish it. And then um, it will, oh, wrong one. So let's go duplicate first occurrences red. I think I had yeah so it did show um duplicate addresses which again can be an indication of a duplicate vendors and you wouldn't have found this is a great example because you wouldn't have found it by tax id because this one didn't have a tax id and this one was just a fat finger park lane way instead of parkway lane don't really know which way it goes but this is a great way to find duplicates by address and then by site um one of the things that I do, um, if you have one of those accounting systems or ERPs that has um, multiple sites or locations um, by vendor ID, then I will include, um, I'll do like a um, duplicate at the site or location level. And so those site and location levels may be different based on payment method or um, 
uh, payment terms or even currency. So what I do is I kind of quickly concatenate all of those um, unique values and then um, I will then do a search or a duplicate um, search on those to see if there are any that are um, duplicate um, that are duplicate sites and then uh, and then go from there. And so again, this one it would be found for the Parkway Lane and you can see that it has the same payment method, the same payment terms, the same currency. So that would be a duplicate. And so that's really what I do for um, duplicates. This is a very short vendor list and in reality, I would be looking at thousands of rows and this AbleBit tools allows me to not have to find it. It will find it um, just by the additional tools that it has. All right, so, all right, so the last poll question is who performs your vendor master file cleanup? And so let me launch that. And then we'll get into some questions. Um, so your AP manager, uh, your AP supervisor, um, other AP employee, uh, a team outside of AP. I know that there are a lot of risk management um, groups that have developed over the more recent years and maybe now since COVID-19 as well, um, but uh, outside of AP or I don't know or it's not done. Okay. So I see some are coming in. Um, we've got some at the AP manager level, AP supervisor, other AP employee. Wow, um, it looks like they're all at 25% um, between AP manager, AP supervisor, other AP employee or outside of AP. Um, so, okay, so it looks like we've got a um, mix. Um, I'm glad we didn't have any responses for I don't know or it's not done, so that's good. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close that. Thank you for the responses. All right, so the next one, um, so I talked about the webinar offer. Um, if you do, uh, purchase the five-day vendor master file cleanup, you will get the toolkit, which has fillable vendor setup forms, desktop procedures, or pre-populated examples, including the email or a letter to the vendor if you need to get additional information. It also includes a free e-guide. Um, I do have quite a few free resources over here on the left. Um, I've got that vendor validation reference list I talked about, a desktop procedure template. So if you do have or are implementing that vendor master file cleanup, make sure you document it. And I got a template to get you started. Um, I've got a W8 um, expiration date tracking form, some on-demand webinars, and I've got some partners here, a partners page. Diversify Robotics is um, one of my partners and they will create a, um, bot for you that will do anything that's rule based and um, they also they actually create it for you for free for the first three weeks so you can um, see how it works for you and uh, then you can go from there so I've got a partners page too and then I did include my contact page here um, which also includes the putting the AP and happy podcast the link to that and then um, we don't have a lot of time for questions. So I would, um, if, if your question is not answered or if you think of a question after the webinar, please feel free to reach out to me at info at deborahrrichardson.com. Um, and I will definitely get to your um, your question via email. I'll also include a link to the recording. Um, to this webinar in um, a follow-up email that you'll receive within three days. Most likely you'll receive it tomorrow around this same time. Okay. So I know we had a question um, about cost and it was, I think it was early on and I think it was um, 10 check. Um, so of the tools that I talked about, 10 check is a paid service uh, subscription plan. Um, 
it's a you get so many single checks per month um, and you can pay for that depending on what you want if you do the bulk upload it's 185 dollars per file and then they also um, if you have more than 850 vendors included on the file they'll give you a break um, a break and will charge you like 22 cents or something per additional record depending on how many records you have um, Smarty Streets will give you for the address validation will give you I think it's 250 single lookups per month um, and then they have a separate um, plan for um, uh, for international and then if you do the bulk lookups I think that's included in the 250 um, because it's still the number of addresses um, so that's paid as well um, Melissa is paid, but again, they give you a thousand free credits and I really only use that for the ones that I can't find anywhere else just to see if it's there. So I actually, um, I've only had to pay once. I uploaded 6,000 records and I had to pay, um, I think it was 30,000, $30, $30 for the 48 EINs that it found. Um, any other questions? So I don't see any other questions. Again, if you think of anything afterwards, please feel free to reach out to info at DeborahRRichardson.com. Thank you for attending this webinar. This webinar is now concluded.